up to this point in this class, uh, we've been pretty <laughs> mathematical. Um, you know, we've been learning mathematical descriptions of systems, of kinematics, of forces. Uh, and today we're going to move on to something that I think is more physics-y, uh, what physicists would call uh, a more phenomenological look. So looking at specific phenomena and seeing how we can describe those. So today we're starting chapter four, which is still about forces, but instead of about forces as these mathematical tools, we're going to talk about actual specific kinds of forces that we might recognize in real life. All right, so there are um, <clears throat> really only a handful of different types of forces that we are going to be dealing with, uh, and so we'll just kind of run through, run through a list. So the first force we're going to be dealing with is weight. Now this is another one of those vocabulary things. Uh, we learned about mass early on, now we're about to learn about weight, and in kind of everyday language these are the same thing, right? What is the mass of that object? Oh, how much does it weigh, right? Those are, those are the same question. Um, but in physics, weight has a specific meaning, and that is the force on an object from gravity. So there is a distinction between the mass of an object, um, which we learned about in terms of inertia, and the weight of an object, which is a force in newtons um, that an object feels pulling it towards the Earth. So the direction of the weight on the surface of the Earth is going to be straight down. Um, if we're in more, more complicated situations, like where we're orbiting orbiting around the Earth or something, uh, the direction of the weight of an object is towards the center of the Earth. But if we're just on Earth's surface and it looks pretty flat, you know, the center of the Earth is <laughs> somewhere down below, so the force we feel is, is straight down. The magnitude of the weight, uh, so we're going to call, so, so the weight is the force of gravity on the object, so we're going to use a variable for weight, F with a G subscript. Some books use W for weight. Uh, I like F sub G just because it reminds you that this is a force like any other. Uh, so the size of this force is equal to M, the mass of the object, times G, the acceleration of gravity on the surface. So G, you know, G we know, G is the same 9.8 meters per second squared. And we already know when we multiply an acceleration by a mass, we get a force. So the units for this um, already work out. So straight down and the size of it is equal to mg. This of course means if we're looking at the y component of forces, you know, we're adding up our forces in the y direction, this is going to be a negative contribution to that, right? On our free body diagram, it's going to look something like this. And so in our, you know, sum of y components of forces, it's going to be minus mg. You know, it's going to show up in there like that. Okay. Um, so this is pretty much all we need to know about weight. A couple other um, facts. If we are on a planet with a different amount of gravity, or like the moon where there's about a sixth the gravity, so this number instead of 9.8 is like 1.6-ish, uh, the weight of that object is lower. The force that it feels pulling it down is lower by the same factor that, that g is lower. Um, so this is why, you know, oh, you only weigh a sixth as much if you're on the moon, or you weigh I forget, a hundred times as much on Jupiter or something like that. Um, so that's, you know, weight is something about an object that can change depending on circumstance. Mass does not. Mass is absolute. This also leads us to an idea of, um, <laughs> of what the mass is doing here. So remember, mass, as we learned about it in Newton's second law, that is the inertial mass. That is how much an object resists having its motion changed. So when an object is not feeling a force of gravity, so let's say we have a spaceship that's really, really far from Earth. Earth's gravity is very, very weak and not pulling on it. Uh, we have not changed the mass of that ship and we have not changed the inertia of that ship. We have not changed how hard it is 
to get it moving, like how hard you have to have to push it to get it to accelerate. Um, all of that has stayed the same. It's just this force has gotten smaller. So the object has not become massless, but it may be weightless if you are far away from something that has gravity. All right. So here's my little demo of the next one. So I have an object, uh, this pen. This pen has some mass, right? It is feeling a force uh, pulling it down from gravity. And yet, if it is sitting in my hand like this, uh, it is not accelerating downward. So Newton's second law tells us that, well, if it's not accelerating, the forces must add up to zero. And we know there's a force down, so there also must be a force up that cancels that out. So this is what we call the normal force. Uh, the word normal here does not mean like the opposite of strange. The word normal here is a mathematical term that means perpendicular to a surface. So normal in, in mathematics means literally perpendicular to a surface. So a normal force is one that we get from a surface when we have an object touching that surface. And the direction of this is built into the name. The direction is perpendicular to the surface. So, um, so the pen is sitting in my hand. My hand is a surface and it is exerting a normal force perpendicular to that surface. It is exerting a normal force upward. Um, and the pen, you know, feeling gravity downward, those two cancel out and the pen doesn't move. Um, so, so we use F sub N for this. Um, some books use N, but I like, again, using F. Um, and its direction <laughs> is uh, perpendicular, and I'll be a little more specific. It's perpendicular and away from the surface. You could say, okay, well, your hand has a surface like this, but this is perpendicular and this is perpendicular. Well, it's the direction that's perpendicular and away from the surface that the object is, is touching. So perpendicular and away from the top of my hand is, is up. Great. Uh, the normal force, uh, we do not have an equation for the size of the normal force. It is totally a circumstances sort of thing, but we do have a rule. And that is the normal force is as big as it needs to be so that the acceleration is zero. And I'll, I'll say a perpendicular, that is the acceleration perpendicular to the surface equals zero. So in other words, if I had this pen sitting on my hand, uh, it would not make sense for, if my hand is sitting here motionless, it would not make sense for my hand to be exerting a big enough force for this to spontaneously jump up in the air or conversely, it needs to be a big enough force that the pen is not going to magically fall through my hand, right? It's just enough force to hold it up and keep it stationary relative to where my hand is. So, um, so yeah, this force is as big as it needs to be so that the acceleration is equal to zero. Um, if we need to know how big this is, we can always figure it out from context from the other forces on our free body diagram. So we'll have examples of this later, but, um, but the normal force is always something we figure out the value of from other forces in the problem that we do know. All right. There's one more thing I should say about normal force that um, that is going to probably come up. In many problems, you may notice that the normal force is the same as the weight. So like in the example of the pen on my hand, I have a force mg down, and if the acceleration is zero, my normal force must be equal to that same mg up, right? Uh, that is not always the case, and that is not a rule to use to figure out how big the normal force is. So um, what I'm gonna write is sometimes Fn equals Fg, but not always. There, uh, every, every year on exams, uh, where there's some find the normal force problem. Um, some student starts the problem by saying, oh, well, the normal force is equal to gravity, and, like, they are wrong right away. And that's, you know, we'll say probably 
between 10 and 20% of students do that. So anyway, don't, don't be caught off guard by this. Um, this is true, but only kind of by coincidence in certain circumstances. Okay, so that's the normal force. The next force we have uh, is friction. And friction and the normal force go hand in hand. We also have friction when an object is at a surface. So friction is another, well, I guess a surface force. And uh, the difference is our normal force was perpendicular to the surface. Our friction is not. Our friction is always parallel to the surface. And here's our mathematical parallel symbol. Our friction is always parallel to the surface. Um, and we have two different kinds of friction that we're going to, uh, to learn about. The first is uh, what we call static friction. So uh, so for that, we use a lowercase f with an s subscript, um, lowercase f for friction. Um, yeah, you could use capital F sub fs, but this is... <laughs> This is fewer letters, so it is better, I think. Um, so our static friction, this is the kind of friction we have where an object is trying to move against a surface, but it is unable to do so. So for example, if I have this eraser, say, on a surface that is tilted, um, we'll learn about tilted surfaces later, but this surface is exerting a friction force parallel to the surface that is keeping the eraser from sliding down this surface. So the eraser is static. It is not moving. That's what static means here. And the static friction is just big enough to keep it from moving. So kind of like the normal force, Fs is as big as it needs to be to keep a perpendicular, or sorry, a parallel equal to zero, that's the acceleration parallel to the surface, but there is a limit. Our static friction can only be so big before at some point our object starts to slide. And we'll learn about why, why that change happens, um, but the important thing right now is there is a limit to how big the static friction can be, um, and it has to be less than or equal to the normal force, so it depends on the normal force, times this constant mu, so this is a Greek letter mu. Is this our first Greek letter? It might be. Um, with an S subscript. So let's um, erase and talk about this. So mu S is the static friction coefficient. It is a unitless number. It is almost always between zero and one. And, um, and it tells us how much friction our surface has. So, so mu depends on what your surfaces are made of and like how, how smooth they are, for example. Um, so, so different types of surfaces have different values of this friction coefficient, like, uh, like a tire on dry asphalt, say, so like, you know, wheels on the road. The friction coefficient of that is roughly like 0.6 or 0.7, I think. Um, on, you know, wet pavement, that same tire might have its friction coefficient reduced to, I forget, like 0.4 or something. And depending on what surfaces we have, those numbers get a lot smaller. You know, wet ice is like 0.1 or something. And really well-machined, flat, uh, lubricated with oil surfaces like in an engine or something like that, or in ball bearings, you can have friction coefficients um, 
less than 0 0.01. So you can have you know, very, very small friction coefficients as well. Um, so in general, the friction coefficient is something you either, you, you probably look it up in a table um, and, uh, or, or it could be something in a problem that you calculate or it could be something you're given at the beginning of a problem and just say, hey, this surface has mu equal to 0.4 or something like that. But you know, in real life, there are tables published with values of mu's for different kinds of surfaces, and you can you can look those up and and use them. So, like I said, look up in a table. This is a like real life application hint. We're probably not going to be looking it up in any tables. Um, if you need a value of mu in a problem, I will probably give it to you at the beginning of the problem. All right. So we're not going to memorize different different values of mu or something like that. Okay, so that's the static friction coefficient. Um, once an object is moving on a surface, so let's say I have my eraser in my hand and it starts um, it starts it starts sliding down, uh, or even if it's on this flat surface and I'm pushing it to move it. It is still feeling friction, but it is feeling a different kind of friction. Uh, that, so different than static friction, this is kinetic friction. So kinetic friction F sub K. So this is object an object moving on a surface. And our kinetic friction is a little bit easier because we actually just have an equation for how big it is. Fk is equal to mu times the normal force. So instead of less than or equal to, it is just equal to. And this mu, in general, can be different than the static coefficient. So we have values of mu s and values of mu k for different surfaces. And they don't, um, they don't have to be the same, but in case you're curious, mu k does have to be less than or equal to mu s, otherwise weird things happen with the math. So this is, um, this is the equation to use for, for kinetic friction for objects that are moving. So I should pause right now and say something else about these friction equations. So all the other equations we've learned up to this point in the class are generally agreed upon to be like mathematical truths of the universe. Like all the kinematic stuff, that just comes out of the calculus math, really. Um, all of this force business, uh, you know, discovered by Isaac Newton, Newton's laws, uh, physicists, I think, mostly agree that those are underlying rules of the universe. Uh, those, you know, those rules are tweaked slightly for very, very small things, like in atoms or very, very big things where you have to worry about relativity. Um, but, but for most things in the universe, that is a, like, strict rule. These friction equations we are learning are not. These friction equations are what we would call models. So if you, you know, observe enough surfaces and you make enough measurements, um, you notice that, oh, well, the force we get seems to be proportional to the normal force that we have. So if we push down harder, we get a bigger, you know, force of friction. And the, the relationship between those two seems to be a constant that changes depending on what the surface is. So, um, so you can build these rules up kind of generally, but it's not hard to find exceptions to these or um, weird cases where they don't really apply because something else strange is happening. So, so the friction equations uh, should not be taken as fundamental rules of the universe. These are convenient equations to describe this interaction between two surfaces moving against each other. Um, and and we, will, we will take them as truth in Physics 106, but I do want to point out there is something intrinsically different about them than, than the other equations.